Praise be to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, creator of the universe, lord of the worlds, sustainer, cherisher, nourisher of one and all. And salutations and blessings upon Muhammad ibn Abdullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Blessings upon all his companions. Blessings upon the four illustrious Imams, namely Abu Hanifa rahimahullah, Malik ibn Anas rahimahullah, Muhammad ibn Idris al-Shafi'i rahimahullah, Ahmad ibn Hanbal yarhamuhumullahu jami'a. Blessings upon all those who have followed Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. All those who are following him, may Allah make us from amongst them. And all those who will follow him until the day of Qiyamah, may Allah make our offspring from amongst them. Honored ulama and respected gathering of brothers and sisters, mothers and daughters, as well as sons. Today, I wish to speak on a very important topic. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant me the acceptance and yourselves as well. That what is said comes from the heart to the heart. And I make a prayer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at the beginning of this talk. Allahumma la ilma lana illa ma allamtana innaka anta al-alim al-hakim. Oh Allah, definitely we do not know anything besides that which you have taught us. For indeed you are the owner of knowledge. You are most knowledgeable, most wise. Grant us a little bit of your knowledge and wisdom. I mean, we all know that in society we have leaders. These leaders are there. Some of us might not know how the leaders are there. But in most cases, the leaders are chosen and elected and selected by the masses. What type of leader would we choose? That question I leave for you to answer. But I can help you think. If you were to be asked the question, what type of leader would you choose? You would definitely choose someone who has the qualities of leadership in brief. Someone who is truthful, who is honest, who does not have bad habits. Someone who has a say, someone who is respected in society and community. Someone whose history speaks volumes as to his goodness. Someone whose goodness exceeds his bad and evil. These are the type of leaders that we would elect. Similarly, if we did not have a say as to the Imam we have in our masjid or the leaders within our own communities, we would always still find that these leaders have good qualities. They are not womanizers. May Allah protect us. And in the case of women, I think I can use the word manizers. May Allah save us all. They are not from amongst those who are drunkards. They are not addicted to drugs. They have not pierced their ears as men, nor have they pierced their belly buttons. And at times, some people go as far as piercing their private parts. May Allah save us and protect us. But the leaders of our communities and our cities and our countries definitely do not have their private parts pierced. The reason I am raising this is to make it very clear that someone somewhere is benefiting by spreading mischief on earth. If a person would like to lead and he wants to be the only one without any threat to his leadership to lead. He needs to ensure that the masses are engaged in filthy activity that will ensure and make sure that they will never be able to compete with him. When we are Muslims, we are taught the qualities of leadership, male and female. We are supposed to be honest, straightforward, what, what we utter from our mouths is supposed to be carefully selected and chosen. The words we speak must be the most beautiful of words. We are supposed to be the most polite, the most decent, the most helpful. We are supposed to be the furthest away from, from drinking, from drugs, 
from homosexuality, from the tattooing of the body in various places, from cutting our hair different sizes, and from piercing the body in all silly places, and so on. I've just mentioned a few. Because we are meant to be those who are dignified, automatically every Muslim is supposed to be a potential leader. Every Muslim is supposed to be a person who can be elected into a post of leadership. If only you followed Islam. And if only we were true Muslims, every single one of us would be able to control our sexual desires. The inclination towards the opposite sex, which is very natural, Islam teaches us to harness it and to control it and to only meet your desires in a halal manner. May Allah grant us chastity and modesty and may Allah protect us. For this reason, the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and remember, he was the leader of leaders. There is no doubt that whatever he taught was brilliance. It was the height of completeness and kamal. Whosoever can guarantee for me the correct use of his tongue, that which lies between his cheeks, and the correct use of that which lies between his thighs, the private parts, male and female, I guarantee for them Jannah. It is a very simple hadith, but it is not very easy to execute and to follow. May Allah grant us the ability and acceptance to control our tongues and our private parts. If you guarantee the correct use of these two, you can smile all the way. The malaika will come to you at the point of death and say, O worshipper of Allah, recite the shahada. La ilaha illallah Muhammadun Rasulullah. You are about to leave this earth. And the last words as you leave this earth will be that particular shahada. May Allah grant it to us. May He take us away with a smile. Why? Because every time we wanted to utter words with our tongues, we asked ourselves, is this what is required? Is this what is needed? Is this what the sunnah is? Is this what the prophet would have said had he spoken? And if it is not the case, we should remain harsh and silent. When you have used your tongue in evil, do you really think that one day when it means the most, you will then use it in good? But if you have constantly used your tongue in good, believe me, the day it is most needed, only goodness will come out of that tongue. May Allah grant that to us. So these are the qualities of leadership. Those non-Muslims who would like to lead, they happen to be leading. They have created a cartel. Why? Because they want to lead and they know that every other community and nation and people every other group of people is easy to dissolve besides the muslims if you take a look at the culture in the west you are regarded as totally free a person who is not oppressed when you wear a mini skirt when you have sex with everyone that you see on the road and when your statements are dirty and filthy, you are regarded as a person, a member of the free world. It is a fact. The minute you wear Islamic dressing or any form of cultural dressing, let us take a look at the African traditional dress, which is brilliant and conforms to Islam. It was dissolved by Western ideology and those who have tried to inculcate a little bit of sense in the masses to say, why did you remove the long piece of cloth which was flowery and beautiful that you had as a skirt and the piece of cloth that you used to wear at the top and the piece of cloth that you used to tie on your head, why did you remove it? They will say, 
you are backward. Let me inform you today, anyone who follows any culture of the old times will always be a more decent person than a person who follows the culture of his lusts and desires. If you take a look at the Victorian era in Great Britain, not very long ago, the women used to dress in long dresses and they used to wear hats which would cover their faces even with nets that would actually come down to cover their faces. But then when those who wanted to rule saw that there is something wrong, if we are to go into leadership, we will have too much competition. They began to sell an idea to the public. Follow your desires and you will be a free person. They came to this world with what is known as freedom of expression, freedom of belief, freedom of this and that, freedom of choice. And by selling this to the world, they began to regard a person who is a gay as someone who belongs to the free world. They have the right to be gay. Na'udhu billah. This is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks in the Quran. Surah Al-Teen. لَقَدْ خَلَقُنَا الْإِنسَانَ فِي أَحْسَنِ تَقْوِيمِ ثُمَّ رَدَدْنَاهُ أَسْفَلَ سَافِلِينَ إِلَّا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا Indeed, we have created man in the best of postures, with the best brain possible. And thereafter, besides those who believe, we have reduced the rest to worse than the worst. Asfala safilin, worse than the worst. Besides those who believe, which means there is an exception to this. If you believe and you do good deeds, you will always be a potential leader. The animals are regarded as worse than us. They have brains, they use those brains. An animal, if you are to train a dog, and I was reading a book two weeks ago about training dogs. Because we have become like animals, we behave like animals. So sometimes we need to read the books of how to train animals in order to train our own children. It's a fact. They say when you want to train a dog, you must only be positive. You cannot be negative. When the dog does something wrong, especially if it is an Alsatian or a dog, a Doberman they call it. Do not punish it, but when it does something correct, you must reward it. So it will understand that whenever I do this, I will be rewarded. If you are to punish it, it will become more vicious. It might turn on you one day. Even the dogs have started changing. Today with our children, when you warn them, they don't want a warning. So what do we do now? When they do anything correct, we've got to tell them, well done. Excellent. What you've done is extremely positive. This is the condition that we have dropped ourselves to. If a cow is given food at half past six in the morning by a certain gentleman, the minute the gentleman comes and the time strikes 29 minutes past six, without being told, the cows know there is goodness from this direction, they will all come to that direction. Because they have understanding, they've got brains also. Whereas if there is a man every day he beats a cow and he inflicts pain upon it, whenever that man is seen, you will find the cows running away. Moments before I came here, we were talking about cows. And I was mentioning to the brothers saying, do you know that if a cow has seen even once the place of slaughter, the day it is being driven there, it will put up a battle before it gets there. It knows automatically this is an evil place. All my brothers and sisters who have gone here have not returned. So even a cow understands what is good and bad. But today we fall prey to the forces of the West, basically. Those forces that are calling us to the so-called freedoms, which are literal whirlpools of destruction. Now let me take you further. Would you ever vote? Would you ever have an imam of a masjid or vote for him or elect him if he is an open, outright homosexual? I see everyone says no. 
Would you ever vote for an imam who has a big earring on his ear? Never. He can be a top reciter, but if his belly is pierced and he's got a massive ring stick sticking out of there, you won't want to listen to the Quran he reads. Similarly, would you ever vote for a leader in your own city here or in your country who is such a drunkard that half his life he doesn't know what he is saying? Addicted to alcohol. You wouldn't. Would you ever vote for a person who is so addicted to drugs that he cannot do without it? No. So now those who want to lead and do not want any body to come in their way need to think of a plan of how to suck people into the whirlpool of destruction that of drugs and alcohol and homosexuality and this type of so-called freedom so that once they are sucked into it they will never ever be potential leaders again this is the beginning now we should understand O oh children who are here today O oh, you who will listen to me at some point or another, remember, stay away as far as possible from drugs and alcohol and homosexuality. Control your sexual activity. Make sure it is within the confines of Islam and the Sharia. Because if you do not, you will then not be a potential leader, not even in your own home. Will you ever be able to lead your own children in your house when you yourself is a so-called drug addict. May Allah protect us all. So the first message goes out to those youngsters and those who have never tried drugs and alcohol in their lives. Remember the environment out there is very pulling. Whenever there is a whirlpool, the waters go deeper and deeper and the entire current flows in that direction. You have got to row the other way and you need greater muscle in order to row in the opposite direction. May Allah grant us the rowing in the opposite direction. And may He grant us the rowing towards Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's way of life. That is the first message and I have relayed it. Do not even try a cigarette. The youngsters who are here today, that is the beginning of destruction. Those who smoke will definitely tell you that do you know what? It's a bad habit. Even if your father smokes or your mother, may Allah save our women folk from this very, very disastrous habit. They will tell you as smokers, my dear son, my dear daughter, it's the last thing I want you to do. Because now they know they are addicted. They are part and parcel of it. Those who have been rehabilitated from a drug addiction, may Allah protect all those who have been involved in drugs in one way or another and save them from this habit and take them out of it they will confirm after they come out of that habit that it is the worst habit those who are on drugs would like to leave it if only they knew how to and that is going to be the second part of this talk but as i said the first is concentrated upon those who have not tried anything remember don't ever make that mistake I always tell the youngsters and it is a statement that I wish you could understand and I hope you don't misunderstand it. If a boy comes to me and says, do you know I have a girlfriend? Or a girl comes and says, I have a boyfriend and I'm madly in love. I can help them because the worst scenario is we can get the nikah done. There is a halal way out of that. That is the worst scenario. But if a youngster comes to me and says, you know what, I am a drug addict. The question I want to pose to you today, when it comes to the opposite sex, Allah knows that there is something within you that inclines you to it. So Allah has made a halal way out so that you can fulfill those desires at some point. But when it comes to alcohol and drugs, believe me, there is no goodness in it at all. For that reason, Allah has never ever kept a halal way out of that. There is no ways that that thing can be made halal for you. The only help I can offer you is to, to try and counsel you to come out of that habit. That is the only solution. So for this reason, my dear youth, and those of us who have been fortunate enough not to get into these habits, the message is loud and clear. 
Prevention is better than cure. We've heard that a thousand and one times. Dirhamu wiqayatin khayrum min qintari ilaj, as the Arabic saying goes. A small amount of effort that is required and expense that is required to protect yourself and to prevent is better than a mountain's worth of medication to solve the problem, to cure. The second stage, oh, you who are involved in this bad habit, we need you. You are tomorrow's leaders. Leave the habit. It is not too late. That is the message I have. When a child is young, baby, the child urinates anywhere and everywhere. For this reason, in order to save ourselves from embarrassment, we love the child, but we know that this child might disgrace us by urinating on someone's beautiful carpet, in someone's beautiful car, in the lounge, on someone's laps. So we put on a nappy. On the child so that when it urinates it urinates in that nappy and does not cause a problem but do we hate a child because they urinate everyone will say no ways we don't hate the child but we will make sure that when the child gets to two years or three years a little bit more a little bit less we train the child something known as nappy training and there are many accidents that will occur during nappy training. Whereas you do not hate the child for making that accident. You will clean it up, but you will hate the urination. Why am I saying this? Because we must understand that in order to solve this matter, and this is the third part of tonight's lecture, I want to discuss the second and third stages. For those of us who are dealing with a crisis either in our homes or in our communities, we must understand, hate the habit, but remember that that person, if they leave the habit, is a potential leader. What is the worst habit? The worst habit that a person can have is kufr. Is that not correct? Kufr is the worst habit. But take a look at Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He was seated in the house of Al-Arqam ibn Abi Al-Arqam radiyallahu anhu. He made a dua. Allahumma a'izza al-Islam bi ahad al-umarayn. O oh Allah, strengthen Islam through one of the two Umars. Who are they? Umar ibn Al-Khattabi radiyallahu anhu or Amr ibn Hisham known as Abu Jahl. These were two enemies of Islam who inflicted a lot of damage on Islam, who always drew their swords for any reason. They lifted up the sword and they were ready to clatter and clash that sword with anyone. And that morning, Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu, who did not know of the dua made by the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the reason I'm mentioning this is to show us, let us make dua for those who are engaged in another type of a bad habit, drugs alcohol homosexuality and the evils of today's time but we make dua for them because if they leave that bad habit tomorrow they can be our leaders and i'm giving you the example of umar ibn al-khattab because he was one of the arch enemies of islam he raised his sword and he said i am going to today kill this prophet muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam and boldly he marched out of his home and as he walked he was met by someone who told him where are you going O Umar with the sword in your hand and marching so boldly he said I am going to kill Muhammad Allahu Akbar and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran Wallahu ya'asimuka minan nas. O Prophet, do not fear. Allah will protect you from the people. On one side, there is a man coming out to kill. On the other side, Allah is protecting someone. Can anyone harm 
Someone whom Allah is protecting, nay, impossible. May Allah protect us in the same way. So this person who met Umar ibn al-Khattab on the road, told him, Ya Umar, Muhammad is very far. Go to your own sister who has accepted Islam, Fatima. Your own sister. And that struck in his head. Let me go to my sister. And he pounded on the door. He heard the verses being recited. As he opened the door, he saw his brother-in-law, his sister, quickly putting some sheets, the type of sheets they had at that time, away. And he inquired, he knew this must have been the Qur'an, something that Muhammad has come with, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. What is it that you had? They refused, because you've got to be clean to touch the Qur'an. La yamassuhu illa al-mutahharoon. None shall touch it besides those who are pure and clean. So they defended those sheets with their life. May Allah grant us the ability to defend the Quran from being desecrated. They said, nay, you will not read this. You will not touch it. You are filthy. He began to beat them until they bled. And when they bled, he saw his sister bleeding. Something went into his heart. This is my blood, my own blood. And it's now dripping. He said, look, I need to read these papers. They said, okay, cleanse yourself. He cleansed himself. And he came. He began to cry. This mountain collapsed by listening to three, four verses. Take me to Muhammad, he exclaimed. Take me to Muhammad. They knew that this man's heart is broken. Broken regarding the hatred he had, but solidified regarding Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. One, the Sahaba radiallahu anhum in the house of Al-Arqam ibn Abil Arqam had heard a dua. On this side, Umar did not know of that dua. He came for damage. He was one of the staunchest enemies of Islam. He had the bad, the most evil habit. And that was the habit of kufr. But suddenly he decided he wants to be a Muslim. And he had his sword. And the few of them marched towards the house of Al-Arqam ibn Abil Arqam radiallahu anhu. And who was at the door? None other than Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib, known as Asadullah, the Lion of Allah. He was standing, he saw Umar ibn al-Khattab, one of the most staunch enemies of Islam, walking with his sword and a little bit of blood around with people bleeding, walking towards this house. What do you think went through his mind as he saw a sword and a man who was known to slaughter and execute anyone walking towards this house? He looked and he said, Allahumma hadha Umar. Oh Allah, this is Umar. Look at the Sahaba radiallahu anhum. In yuridillahu bihi khayran yuslim. Wa in yakun ghayra thalika yakun qatluhu alayna hayyina. Ya Allah, if you intend goodness with this man, let him accept Islam. And if he intends anything else, make it easy upon us to execute him here and now. Immediate. And the swords were drawn, ready in waiting. Where is Muhammad? Aina Muhammad? Where is Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? He burst into the room with all the sahaba radiallahu anhum, ready to see what Umar does. What type of guts this man had, I'm sure we've heard about. This nothing would stop this man from achieving what he would like to achieve. And the sahaba radiallahu anhum were ready to pounce on him, 
when he looked at Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and said, Inni ashadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashadu annaka abduhu wa rasooluh. And everyone said, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. This is Umar. Allah has brought him to Islam. Allahu Akbar. He left the bad habit. Do you know what happened? Immediately he looked at Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and asked his first question. Ya Rasulallah. Imagine now he addressed him, O Messenger of Allah, alasna ala al-haq. Are we not on the right path? Bala, the answer was indeed we are on the right path. Well then, let us proudly march to the Haramain, to the Haram in Mecca. Why are we reading Salah in the house of Al-Arqam ibn Abil Arqam? We will march and we will read in public. Nothing will stop us today. And they made two lines immediately. They made two safs. One was led by Umar ibn al-Khattab. The other was led by Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib. And they marched, re-uttering the takbir all the way to the masjid. The kuffar could not say anything at all. They were humbled and hushed. They had to look and say, hey, Umar is with them today. And that was the first time in the history of Islam that salah was read there. The type of salah is not the exact salah we have today because at that time salah was not yet made compulsory it was only given to rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam on the occasion of mi'raj which happened later on and for this reason it was not prescribed in the masjid it could have been read anywhere at the time why did i relate this story today to show you that if you remove this bad habit Tomorrow, Allah can use you to defend this deen. If you remove this habit in split seconds, Allah can raise your status very high. Umar ibn al-Khattabi radiallahu anhu, by uttering those words, became one of the best to ever trod this earth after the Anbiya alayhi salatu wasalam. I can pinpoint and tell you his rank. He was second after all the Anbiya. First was Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, and second was Umar ibn al-Khattabi radiallahu And he only achieved it because he realized that he was getting sucked into the whirlpool of evil. Later on he spoke and he said, do you know, we used to worship idols that we used to make of dates. When we were hungry, we used to eat the hand. We used to eat this and that. We used to eat our own gods. He has uttered that and they used to laugh about it. So those who have come out of drugs will tell you, do you know what? We were fools. We used to disturb our mothers and parents. Today we are parents. And we pray that our children be guided from this habit. So the message here to those who may be engaged in drugs in one way or another, it is never too late to turn to Allah. It requires a lot of willpower. It requires great willpower. And you must understand, don't let shaitan deceive you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is waiting for you. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is calling out to you every single day. He stretches his hand. The hadith says, Inna Allah ta'ala yabusutu yadahu billayli liyatuba musi'un nahar wa yatlubu wa yabusutu yadahu bin nahari liyatuba musi'un layli hatta tatlu'a shamsu min maghribiha rawahu al-Bukhari. What a hadith. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala stretches the hand of mercy every day to forgive those who have committed sin by night and stretches the hand of mercy every night to forgive those who have committed sin by day until the sun rises from the other side and it has not yet risen. Yet another hadith proving that Allah is waiting for you. O oh, you who is engaged in these bad habits, whatever it is, O oh, you who have been engaged in zina, it is time to turn to Allah. Alam ya'ni lilladhina amanu an takhsha'a qulubuhum li dhikrillah. Has the time not come for those who believe to turn to Allah and to turn to the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? The question we must pose to ourselves, those who are engaged in zina, those who are engaged in the, the partaking of alcohol, those who might be going to the casinos and blowing their money in the wrong way. How long is this going to carry on for? Surely we need to prepare for life that is beyond the eternal life. The hadith says, 
ينزل ربنا إلى السماء الدنيا كل ليلة حين يبقى ثلث الليل الأخير فيقول هل من تائب فأتوب عليه هل من مستغفر فأغفر له هل من سائل فأعطيه سؤله Every eve, every early morning when a third of the night is remaining Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's valor descends and he calls out from the lowest heavens saying is there anyone seeking my forgiveness that I can forgive him or her? Is there anyone repenting to me that I can accept that repentance? Is there anyone asking me anything that I can, I can grant them whatever they want? Most probably we are snoring at that hour of the morning. Is it fair? Set your alarm clock to get you up at three o'clock, not necessarily to read tahajjud. We have not yet got to that stage. But just to get up for two minutes in your bed whilst you are cozy, raise your hands and say, Ya Allah, I know you are calling. You are asking who is there seeking forgiveness so that you, you, for you will forgive. Ya Allah, I am the one seeking forgiveness. And feel your hair stand. Wallahi, I swear by Allah, I swear by Allah who has raised the skies with no pillars that he definitely calls out and he is waiting for me and you. Imagine how he will feel when he is calling out, who wants to ask me something? And you have set your clock to get up at that moment just for five minutes to say, Ya Allah, it's me. I am weak. I need you, Ya Allah. I am the one who is calling out to you. I have this problem, that problem. Protect me, safeguard my children. Do you know what he says? <laughs> I always answer the call of the caller positively whenever he calls out to me. Subhanallah. How can we even feel for a split moment that Allah has not responded to our dua? Innaka sami'u dua Zakariya alayhi salam when he called out what did he say he said oh Allah I'm calling out to you I know you are the one who listens and hears the duas wa ya'rifu su'lahu hatta qubayl an-nutq bi da'wat Allah knows your dua before you utter it he knows it from your heart and Allah knows how you would have preferred to word your dua. Sometimes we can't even word our duas. Some people have complained to me that we raise our hands and we forget how to call out to Allah. We forget what we wanted to say. Don't worry, my dear mother and sister, my dear brother and elder here. Remember one thing. Allah knows that dua from your heart even before you utter it. But have you ever got up at that hour of the morning just for a few minutes? If you are strong enough, you can get out of your bed, make wudu, read two rakats of tahajjud, a few rakats of tahajjud. May Allah grant us that level. But if not, at least call out to him at that hour and go and sleep at five past three once again. Two minutes, at least you have asked Allah. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will respond. You will feel his mercy, his blessings. You will feel the contentment your day will be spent in a different way. I guarantee that for you. Because you know there was a communication between you and your creator. There was a link. He called out, you called back to him. And he called back to you and you called out to him again. Subhanallah. Imagine if you had a link with the president of this country. Such that he would contact you every day and you would talk to him and he would talk to you. He would never phone you in a rush. Is that not correct? It's when you need him, you'll phone him. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls out to you. He dials your number on a daily basis. All that is required of you is to answer that communication and to speak back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then again, we are sleeping at that hour. We need to do something about this. We need to turn to Allah and believe me, he will grant us whatever we want. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls out. In fact, another hadith says, Inna Allah yaqbilu tawbat al-abdi ma lam yugargir. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala always accepts the tawbah of all his worshippers for as long as they have not got to sakarat. 
Shaitan comes to us and makes us feel that your tawbah is rejected. It is not accepted. Allah did not forgive you. In Islam, we are taught that when Allah has forgiven you, he never raises the past. It's gone and deleted. So don't let it bog you down. Nothing that you have committed in the past is too big for Allah to forgive. When Allah says, قُلْ يَا عِبَادِيَ الَّذِينَ أَسْرَفُوا عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ لَا تَقْنَطُوا مِنْ رَحْمَةِ اللَّهِ Say to the worshippers who have transgressed against themselves, never lose hope in the mercy of Allah. Sometimes we lose hope in the mercy of Allah. So we are going against the commands of Allah by losing hope. We are insulting Him. He says, Oh my worshippers, I am most forgiving, most merciful. When we start, we say, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. We don't say, Bismillahir Sahib al Adab al Alim. We always say in the name of Allah, most forgiving, most merciful. We never say in the name of Allah, the one who punishes very severely. Never ever. That is an insult to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He speaks of Rahman and he speaks of Rahma and mercy. Remember, turn to Allah. It is high time we turned. Oh, you who is involved in sin, the Ummah needs you. The people of Iraq need you. The people of Palestine need you. Not in person. But they need you to reform yourself because if you reform yourself and other members of the community reform themselves, that is the only time Allah will grant reformation to every community, every country, and thereafter the Ummah at large. <laughs> Allah will never transform the condition of any Ummah. For as long as the individuals of that ummah do not transform themselves. So if I want to help the people of Iraq, I need to transform myself. I need to be better with my own family members, with my wife, with my husband, with my children, with my parents, with my in-laws, and so on. I need to be tolerant with them. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will then effect positive change in the whole ummah. Today, we pick on this person and that person not realizing that the solution to it lies in rectifying our own weaknesses. So the message here, turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Do not fall prey to the forces of evil around us. Oh, you who is involved in selling drugs and alcohol and making money out of it. Remember, it is something very dangerous. Why do you want to shoulder the burden of the sin of everyone? Can I tell you? Can I take you down the avenue of reality for a moment? Do you know that by selling this drug, you have removed contentment from your life in its totality? You can have a million and a billion, but you live in constant fear. There is a way of coming out of this fear. You just need to turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You live in constant fear. Anything you ever buy will be short-lived. Your desires will not exist for longer than 30 minutes. You will then feel remorse and regret. You will live a life of gangsterism, which you will hate yourself. But if you allow yourself to get deeper into it, I swear that regret will become so strong, but you will not be able to do anything about it because of the lack of willpower. You will have the dirtiest friends and you will know that your friends are dirty, but because you allowed yourself to fall into this dangerous activity for the love of the rand and the dollar, for that reason, you will not be able to do anything about it unless you have a strong willpower. And for all I care, you may be shot dead one day and suddenly you lose your life. What did you gain? Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, La ilaha illa Allahu, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, walillahi alhamd. That is the takbir that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has declared. And that is the takbir we read on the days of happiness. We must understand it is the most powerful takbir you can have. May Allah grant that to us. And through the power of His greatness, may He take out of the clutches of shaitan even those who might be dealing in drugs i mean you are members of the ummah inshallah we will try to nappy train you but come and admit your faults don't worry we will not beat you up when you are admitting your fault 
We will not make du'as against you. We will make du'a for you. Look at Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He did not make a du'a against Umar ibn al-Khattab. He made a du'a for Umar ibn al-Khattab. And what happened, Umar ibn al-Khattab came into the fold of Islam. We will follow the same blessed sunnah. We will make a du'a for you. But don't force us to make a du'a against you. By sucking away all our children. Let me ask you a question. Do you really want to shoulder the sin of everyone who buys that drug from you until the day of Qiyamah? No, you don't. Such a person may lose the dunya and the akhirah. And Allah says that is a clear loss. Take a look at the kuffar. Most of them who have qualities of leadership are not on drugs. They do not have bad habits. They are enjoying the dunya to a certain extent. But they might lose the akhirah. But those who are Muslimin, you will be content in the dunya, inshallah, and Allah will still grant you the akhirah. But those who have lost the dunya by engaging in activity that results in them ducking and diving and hiding and living in fear constantly for their whole lives, it is a fake life. And in the akhirah, you get absolutely nothing. Do you really want that? Believe me, I am sent to you to convey this message to you. It is no coincidence that I am here today speaking to you. It was chosen by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala a long, long time ago. I am here to deliver the message of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I will be asked on the day of Qiyamah, you went to this masjid, did you speak to them? And I will say, Ya Allah, I have spoken. There are witnesses here who bear witness for me, inshallah, that I have delivered the goods. Now, the response must come from you. Have you heard what was said today? It is not too late to turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Consider the positives and negatives with your brain and you will really and deeply understand that there is more to gain by leaving these bad habits. How many people have you put into pain? Your own mother, your own father, your relatives, your wife, your husband, maybe your children, your grandchildren, your community members. It results in shaitan getting hold of us. We need to turn away from shaitan. May Allah protect us and our offspring and our community members from shaitan. I was saying Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to constantly make dua of guidance for everyone. Inshallah, we want to follow that sunnah. We will also make dua of guidance for you and for ourselves. But don't force us to do otherwise. If you take a look at the sunnah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when he was in Ta'if, an incident that I often mention and I wish to share it with you today. What happened in Ta'if? He was the best creature ever to exist, the best that will ever exist, the most beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He went to Ta'if to take the people out of Jahannam and bring them into Jannah. That is what we are trying to do today. May Allah take us all out of Jahannam and put us into Jannah. Every single one of us. We all need help in one way or another. He went to remove the people of Ta'if from Jahannam and bring them into Jannah. Do you know what happened? They began to beat him up. Allahu Akbar. They swore him. They laughed at him. And yet he was saying, Oh people, I want you to go into paradise. Oh people, leave your bad ways. Leave your bad habits. Exactly what we are saying today. They beat him up, they laughed at him, they mocked at him. The children were even taught to laugh at him and mock and make jokes of him and run behind him. As he was leaving Ta'if, they began to throw stones at him. And Allah was watching. Do you think Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was not watching? His most beloved was definitely being watched. And Allah knew what was happening. The angels were watching and they were waiting for a command from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Oh my angels, go to this man, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And if he orders you to crush these people, bring the mountains together and crush them. For today, 
it is too much what they are doing. Allahu Akbar, it was definitely too much. So the angels immediately executed the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They went down to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam whilst he was bleeding and think of the droplets of blood. Whose blood was this? Every drop of blood was the most sacred blood that ever existed. Every drop, if lost in this manner, is known as shaheed. It is martyred in the path of Allah. His shoes were full of blood. And he was walking. And the angels came to him, O oh Muhammad, give us one instruction and we will crush everybody who is here between the two mountains. Innama bu'ithtu rahmah. Indeed, I have been sent as a mercy, he said. Allahumma hdi qawmi fa innahum la ya'lamun. O oh Allah, guide this nation for definitely they do not know. They don't know what they are doing. They don't realize what they are doing. And then he raised his hands, which had blood. Imagine the angels were waiting to see what is this man going to utter. We have told him, your wish, our command, basically. What is this man going to utter? We will execute it immediately. Today, he has been made to bleed by little children. He raised his, his hand, Allahumma, O oh Allah. Now he's not calling out to the angels, remember that. He's calling out to Allah, O oh Allah, inni ashku, I am complaining to you. Who are you complaining about? We will destroy them immediately. The angels were waiting to hear what comes out of the mouth, Mubarak, blessed mouth of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa The angels were waiting to hear what is the statement. And Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam actually raised his hands. And he actually said, Oh Allah, I am complaining. For the first time in his life, he was about to complain. The word complain came out of his mouth. For the first time in his entire life. The angels were waiting to execute whatever comes out of the mouth of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam at that time. And what came out? Allahumma inni ashku ilayka dhafa quwati wa qillata hilati. Oh Allah, I am complaining to you about my own weakness. I am weak. Allahu Akbar. Imagine how the angels must have felt that we are waiting for instruction of destruction. And here is Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam making a dua saying, Ya Allah, I am complaining to you about my weakness. I am weak, Ya Allah. You sent me to deliver a message to the people of Taif. Look at me. I have gone there. They have booted me out of there. They have beaten me, Ya Allah. I pray that you are not upset with me. If you are not angry with me, Ya Allah, there is nothing else I want. Which means, Ya Allah, I only want your pleasure. This was the dua made on the occasion of the incident of Ta'if. That was Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Today I make that dua here in this masjid. May Allah accept it from us all. Where we say, Allahumma inna nashku ilayka dhafa quwatina. Oh Allah, we are complaining to you about our weakness. Look at the people on drugs around us. Ya Allah, we are so weak, we can't even help them. Ya Allah, it is only you who can bring them back to the masajid. Ya Allah, help us. We are weak. We are complaining to you, Ya Allah. We have no power and strength left in us, Ya Allah. Let us make this dua for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We have a grave problem in our area. We have a grave problem overtaking the Muslim ummah, the same religion that teaches us so much goodness, the same religion that makes every single one of us potential leaders. And we have so many cabbages in our ummah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the strength and use us to serve this deen. Oh, you who is involved in one way or another in evil, wallahi, I tell you, and I plead with you to turn back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You will never regret it. Come and open up. Come to the imams of the masajid. Go to the doctors. Go to your parents and admit your errors. That is the only time we will be able to help you. When you have a cough and you go to the doctor, you don't just look at the doctor and smile. He asks you what is wrong. Minimum, you've got to point at your throat. So he can diagnose the problem and give you some medication. 
I work with people who are on drugs, believe me. People who are addicted to alcohol. And Alhamdulillah, some of them have come out of this habit. Believe you me, literally they are nappy trained. It takes them a year, two years. They might fall once or twice. But if you know how to deal with them through the sunnah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you will definitely be able to succeed by the qudra of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That was the second part. The address to those who are involved in either taking drugs or buying and selling it, especially selling it. That is a very grave crime in Islam. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the ability to understand. And the third and last part of this lecture tonight, may Allah accept it from us. The address to those who are affected by someone around them or related to them who might be on drugs, either your child, your brother, your sister, your parent. May Allah save us all. What is the address to you? I want to mention one hadith. There is a long hadith regarding a man who walked into the masjid of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and in one corner of the masjid he urinated. As he began to urinate the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, the very Umar that we spoke about moments ago, may Allah grant us their companionship in the Akhirah. Ameen. They roared and they wanted to beat this man up. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, La tazmuru, leave him. Do not stop him. He might get sick if he has to hold back his urination. Let him complete what he's doing. Allahu Akbar. Think of this in a masjid. Today, if someone had to come into this masjid and only expose their private parts, forget about urination. I think how many bullets would be in that man's head, we would lose count. It's a fact, honestly. Especially in this area. So imagine the Sahaba radiallahu anhum were told to leave him to complete what he was doing. He finished. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam called him and sat him down and told the Sahaba radiallahu anhum to go and engage themselves in getting a bucket of water to cleanse that area so that they would not all listen in to what was happening in such a way that this man would feel offended. This is now counseling. Counseling, we need to talk. We need to use speech that is positive to solve the problem. If they beat him up, he might have left Islam and carried on saying, you know, I came here to be a Muslim. As it is, these people are hard and harsh. They don't even understand anything. I am gone. Nothing achieved. But the reason I am raising this habit, meaning this hadith today, we have the problem of drugs. We need to know how to deal with it from the sunnah. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has not forgotten to teach us anything. Ma taraka khayran illa wa dallana alayh wa la sharran illa hadharana min. There is no goodness that he has forgotten to show us and no evil that he has forgotten to warn us against. Nothing. Beautiful example. لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنَةٌ The Quran says, Indeed for you is the greatest example in Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That is why we are mentioning this hadith. He called this Arabi, this Bedouin. He called him and he said, Do you know what? With a smile, speaking to him in the most calm of tones. What you have done, you must understand this masjid is the house of Allah subhanallah. This masjid is a sacred home of Allah, the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in which we should engage in remembrance of Allah, in salah, in the reading of Quran, in these good deeds, but it is not for such activity. This man was so happy, he understood the statement. He would never repeat this again. Do you know what he said out of happiness? Allahumma arhamni warham Muhammada wa la tarham ma'ana ahada. Oh Allah, have mercy upon me and have mercy upon Muhammad and don't have mercy on anyone besides the two of us. That's it. 
Why? Because he was upset with everyone else. They did not counsel him in the correct manner. But for them, it was a moment of learning as well. They noticed and believe me, they heard. If they didn't hear, it wouldn't have got to us today. Allahu Akbar. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told that man that you have tried to make narrow something that is very broad and wide. What does that mean? That means you are saying the mercy of Allah must only be on the two of us. That can't happen because the mercy of Allah encompasses everything. It is very broad. You can't just make it narrow for the two of us. So that also he solved the problem there as well. Take a look at how he spoke. He gave him so much hope and courage. It is reported that that Bedouin became one of the purest of the Arabs after that. He was always worried about how he used the toilet and how he cleansed himself and so on. You can imagine. So drawing a parallel from that hadith, being on drugs and being addicted to alcohol and so on and so forth. These are bad habits which we need to tackle. But we need to employ the most effective manner, manner of changing this habit. And it differs from person to person. Sometimes if you scold and scream and doom people, they might never come back. They might feel as it is, I am doomed. As it is, I am going to Jahannam. Now what's the point of going back? But if you always lend that rope to them and tell them, listen, Allah is waiting for you. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. The hadith mentions the happiness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When someone turns to him, he becomes so happy. Allahu Akbar. How can Allah become happy when we turn to him? He doesn't need us. But that is Allah's mercy. He becomes happy. He is waiting. Imagine you are pleasing your creator. The one you, whom you are going to return to becomes pleased with you. He's happy with you. May Allah take us away in a condition that he is happy with us. So we need to speak to them. We need to always give them hope in turning. And remember the world out there is very, very full of these freedoms, so-called freedoms. We can lose our children at any time. Try and interact with your children. We do not want, and literally I'm going to mention it in this masjid. We don't want a cat and mouse relationship with our children anymore. We need to be the best friends of our children. Go out with them in, to places where they can enjoy themselves within the limits of Islam and let them do it with you around them. When they go out with their friends, tell them, bring your friends home. Come and have a party here. It might cost you a little bit, but believe me, it is cheaper than the difficulty that you might go through had you allowed them to go to someone else's house and you don't know where they've been. Guide them when it comes to the type of friends they must keep from the very beginning and help them in this regard. Speak to them, smile with them, tell them how much you love them and let them talk to you openly. When your child comes to you and says, mommy or daddy, today I've tried a cigarette. You don't automatically explode anymore. It doesn't work in most cases. Nor must you be happy with that because that also is wrong. You need to choose the middle path. Sit down and engage the brain. Look at what Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did in this hadith. He sat the man down and engaged his brain. In two sentences, the man understood everything. Engage the brain of the child. Talk to them like adults. My dear son, and now you need to educate yourself about this because you won't be able to speak to them unless you know the evils of smoking. Do you know such and such a person started smoking? They lost their money. They burnt their money. They had bad habits. They burnt their clothes. They used to smell and stink. Their wife used to complain about them so much because they never had a decent kiss from that husband. May Allah grant us, subhanallah, the sweetness of halal, which is also something fulfilling. I mean, Wallahi, I tell you at times we take it for granted. Puff after puff and we don't realize who is being or who is doing all the suffering. Sometimes there are silent sufferers who don't utter anything. May Allah grant us the understanding. I have pointed towards the direction. I hope we've understood. 
So we need to engage the child in this sort of a dialogue according to their level and explain to them this person has actually suffered this sickness, this illness. Let me show you the box, what it says. Smoking kills. Two words, smoking kills. My dear son, my dear daughter, you tried one. Don't think it's a good habit. It is a very, very bad habit. And so on. Engage the brain. And inshallah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, through engaging the brain in the method of the sunnah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, will also grant us success. Now we have a difficulty of someone who is already in it. Talk to them and say, look, my dear son, if you admit to me, I'm not going to blow my top. I want to help you. I need to help you. I am your mother. I am your father. I want to help you, but admit to me before it gets too late. Who is it that is threatening you? Who is it that is gathering against you? What is it that is bothering you? If they open up and they say, you know what? I've been on drugs for the last four years. Yes, we might need help ourselves to come to terms with that statement. But it must not make you blow up automatically. It happened under your nose. You must now deal with it. You must be the doctor and that is your patient. Subhanallah. That is your patient. Take a look at the doctors and the psychiatrists of this world. Do you know, do you know what they do? They get paid to deal with the same patient with the problems and they will suffer counseling that patient knowing that this patient has very little hope until they themselves die or the patient dies. But because they are getting money in return, they don't mind. That's their job. I read statistics which say 60% of psychiatrists after 15 years of service themselves need help. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala assist us. This is our patient, our own blood. We will be paid by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because we will be fulfilling his command. Ya ayyuha alladheena amanu qu anfusakum wa ahlikum nara. O you who believe, save yourselves and your family members from the fire. May Allah grant us savior. And don't ever lose hope in the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you are to counsel your own child to accept the problem and to stand up to it and to do something positive about it and to help others in it, then remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may resurrect you right next to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam because you also strived in a different manner but for the same cause. And he might call you along to say, I have heard of the efforts you have put. Come and stand right next to me. Allahu Akbar, may Allah grant that to us. And I wish to end on one note. O oh, you who are listening to me, remember if you are going to help anyone who has a bad habit, come out of that bad habit for the sake of Allah, even if they are not related to you, Allah will protect you and your offspring from falling into that habit. It is reported that if you help an old person, one day Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will create someone who will help you when you are old. If you are concerned about the sick, Allah will create people who will be concerned about you the day you are sick. And if you go out to help them, and you make dua for their cure and you assist them positively regarding the cure, Allah might even protect you totally from that sickness. If you go to those who have AIDS and give them hope in the mercy of Allah, Allah may protect you and your offspring from that very disease. That is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He says, you come to me a handspan, I come to you a foot. You come to me walking, I will come to you running. Hundred steps are to be taken, you take one, I take 99. Allahu Akbar, Kabira. That is Allah. But we don't even want to take the one step. We are lazy. And we lose hope so, so soon. And we are only interested in our own family members. Not realizing this ummah 
is Ummah of the Shahada. La ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah. That is the Shahada, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We become thicker than blood. We've all uttered it here. Let us help each other. Any member of this ummah who is in need in help, try and help them. A person who has AIDS, believe me, you are not doomed. You might be in Jannah before me than anyone else. Those who have cancer, at least Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you the chance to prepare for death. How many leave this world without having prepared anything? Nothing at all. Those who have AIDS, you might have made one or two mistakes. You might have got it innocently. Believe you me, you are not doomed to go to Jahannam. Most probably you will suffer once in this dunya. And as you enter the Akhirah, you will go into such coolness that your grave may be one of the biggest graves and the gardens from amongst the gardens of paradise. And it is our duty as members of the Ummah and the community to go out and hunt for these people who are falling prey to others who have come to them from other sects and denominations and religions who are sucking them away, giving them sweet words. And those words are fake. Yet our words are genuine, but our mouths seal up. When there is a swear word to be uttered, we are the first. But when there is goodness to come out of our mouths, where are we, O Ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Let us effect positive change. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the ability to change for the better. And may he elevate our status. May he use us to serve this deen. May we be from amongst those who can help others come out of their problems. Who can always think of positive solutions to negative problems. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala save our children and the youth of this ummah from drugs and alcohol and homosexuality and from the casinos and bad habits and from all forms of evil and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala save myself and yourselves as well may he take us through to Jannah may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala elevate our status and bring us closer to him every day in such a way that the last day when he takes us away we will be the closest to him than we ever were and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us from amongst those who understand that when a person has a bad habit, we are fighting the habit and not the person. Allahu Akbar. In the same way that I mentioned, when we nappy train, we are fighting the urination and not the little baby of ours. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us all potential leaders. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant this ummah leadership that can guide it and steer it to success. That will only happen through the practice and the sunnah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. May Allah grant that to us. A lot can be said, but I have uttered whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has written for us to utter. May Allah accept it from me. And may Allah accept the listening from yourselves. On this day, we raise our hands in dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, asking him from his mercy. اللهم صل على نبينا محمد وعلى آل نبينا محمد وبارك وسلم يا الله فقِّف our sins يا الله we have committed so many sins يا الله that we don't even remember the sins we've committed يا الله we've lost count of the sins we've committed يا الله you know all of them forgive us يا الله we know that whenever we raise our hands for you you forgive us يا الله and you grant us our wish and our dua يا الله we've raised our hands helplessly to you يا الله yet we are so hopeful in your mercy يا الله Without you, we are helpless. But with you, Ya Allah, there is nothing else that we need. Ya Allah, we know you have forgiven us. So grant us the ability to feel this forgiveness, to feel the mercy, to feel the barakat, to feel better people. Ya Allah, we promise and we undertake that we will never engage in any of the bad habits we've been engaging in in the past, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, make us strong. Protect us from zina, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, whatever we've committed in the past, Ya Allah, forgive us. We know you've forgiven us, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, we know that you always say that you never return turn anyone's hands without having answered their dua ya allah ya allah forgive us protect us from zina protect us from alcohol ya allah protect our children and the ummah from bad habits from drugs ya allah from all the evils that are going on around ya allah from piercing different parts of their bodies ya allah in such a way that it is earns your wrath ya allah ya allah save us ya